Welcome. Let's explore the awesome power of V squared. Several formulas used in aviation use the term V squared or velocity squared. The significance of this becomes apparent as we discover that velocity affects performance in a big way. The first two formulas are closely related. These are the formulas for lift and drag. Lift is one half rho V squared S times the coefficient of lift, and drag is one-half rho v squared s times the coefficient of drag. Now, before you get scared off, I'll explain. It's really pretty simple. Each of these formulas, we have a p, or rho, which is simply the air density, or its weight per cubic foot, how thick the air is. s is a square area of the wing or other surface, how much of that air we can affect, and the coefficient of lift or drag, depending on what we're measuring, this value will change with things like the angle of attack and the shape of the airfoil, how much we're affecting the air. Each of these factors will affect the lift or drag in a direct proportion to their value. Half the air density, you get half the lift. Double the square of the wing, you get twice the lift, and so on. And then we have V squared, which means, of course, that the velocity, or speed, is multiplied by itself. If we double this value, we get four times the lift. We also get four times the drag. Triple the value and we get nine times. This is why for an airplane to go twice as fast, you basically need four times as much thrust. When we want to go faster, we pay a steep penalty. Most airplanes can barely double their speed, their indicated airspeed, within their operating range. Now on takeoff, we just get off the ground and fly low, waiting for the tow plane to accelerate. As our speed increases, if we were to simply hold a constant pitch attitude, and therefore a constant angle of attack, our lift would increase rapidly as the airspeed builds. For that reason, as we accelerate, we'll need to lower the nose to maintain the same altitude while we wait for the tow plane to be airborne. As we go up in altitude, the air density decreases. To make up for this, we fly a faster true airspeed, which results in the same indicated airspeed for the same amount of lift. The nice thing is that both the lift and drag are both affected proportionally to the air density, so our glide ratio remains the same regardless of altitude. However, we will have a higher true airspeed to receive that same glide ratio. But at around 20,000 feet is where the density is half that at sea level, we don't have to go twice as fast to generate the same amount of lift, since the impact of a small speed increase is so much greater. There, our true airspeed will only need to be about 35% faster. By the way, did you know you can estimate your true airspeed by adding about 2% of your indicated airspeed in altitude? At 10,000 feet, you're going roughly 20% faster than indicated, a little less below 12,000 and a little bit more above it. In another example, as we make a steep turn and tighten the bank angle up to 45 degrees, the outer wing tip is going faster than the inner wing tip, maybe 10 knots faster. But that small speed difference adds up to more lift and drag on the outer wing, forcing us to cross control in those tight turns to avoid an ever increasing bank angle. Since this also works for drag as well as lift, if you want to get rid of energy, you'll get that same effect by going faster we can increase our drag exponentially by going faster. That exponentially higher drag will convert your excess altitude and airspeed to heat, noise, vibrations, and turbulence. Negative flaps help to reduce this effect by reducing the coefficient of lift, but V squared still wins out. The next bit of magic concerns our kinetic energy. This is simply the energy of motion. The formula looks like this. Kinetic energy is equal to one-half mv squared. Again, we have a direct relationship with one parameter, m, the mass, and then there's v squared again. Therefore, if we double our mass, we have twice the kinetic energy. It takes longer to get going, takes longer and more effort to stop. But it's pretty hard to double your mass. There's certainly no way to do it in flight, and even dropping a heavy water ballast load won't cut the glider's weight in half. But a change in our velocity and that can make a big difference in how much energy we have. This is how little rocks make big craters. This is why it's hard and expensive to get a rocket into orbit, because they need to change their velocity by a lot, 
and that needs an exponential amount of energy to do it. But let's explore a very different scenario where V squared plays an important role for gliders, landing distance. Specifically, in a downwind landing scenario, because here we have the opportunity to make a big difference in the landing velocity at the same indicated airspeed. Let's take a typical 1,000 pound Schweitzer 233. We'll say on a calm day, we'll touch down at around 40 miles an hour. Now we'll plug in some numbers, convert the English units to meters per second and kilograms to generate the kinetic energy value in joules. So at zero wind, landing at 40 miles an hour, we have 72,000 joules or 72 kilojoules. With a 10 knot headwind, 25% slower, and therefore a touchdown speed of 30 miles an hour, our kinetic energy is 40.7 kilojoules, 44% less energy. How about with a 20 mile an hour headwind? Now we're touching down at a ground speed of 20 miles an hour and a kinetic energy of only 18 kilojoules, half the speed and a quarter of the energy. But if we want to do a return to the field and land downwind with that 20 mile wind, now we'll have a ground speed of 40 plus 20 or 60 miles an hour. 50% faster than the calm wind scenario for two and a quarter times the energy. And three times faster than landing into a 20 mile hour wind for nine times the energy. These higher energies are what you need to get rid of to stop the glider. This is why it quickly becomes a risky move to land downwind with a high tailwind. Perhaps you've recognized these formulas all have in common. They're all extrapolations of Isaac Newton's second law of motion, F equals MA, or a force, for example, lift or drag, or the force required to stop a glider, is equal to the mass, whether it's the glider's mass or the air flying over the wing, times the acceleration. And what is an acceleration? but a change in velocity over time, or feet per second per second, written as velocity squared, or V squared. Be sure to check out my Soaring Resources page, thesoaringpage.com. It has content for every level of soaring pilot, as well as for renters and glider owners and CFIGs. Please subscribe. Thanks for watching.